people have stopped having kids, it's been because they see the point in social mobility in educating kids and in smaller families. Mm -hmm. At present in Egypt, the situation says the more kids you have, the more people you can send out to work. Because mm -hmm. education That's is how they believe us. Yeah. It, so until and unless we do something about the methods of production, up till now a uh, workshop in an informal area or a farm, a little piece of land you need to farm requires hands. Mm -hmm. And the more hands you have, uh, the, the more you will produce. Uh, minimally, I mean, you make marginal incomes, mm -hmm. but you need the hands. To do. We have to move the technology up gradually so that you don't need as many hands. That's mm -hmm. one. The other is uh, poverty mm -hmm. and, and poor education. It's still people, the poor, make very poor returns on the education of their children. They pull them out of the workforce and they say, okay, we're going to sacrifice. We're going to mm -hmm. get that kid in school and keep it there. By grade three, that child is still unable to read. Mm -hmm. So grade mm -hmm. three is the largest dropout uh, uh, grade. Uh, uh, those who say, okay, we'll keep him a little longer than grade six, find out that at grade six, the child still doesn't have the prospects that it has cost them to mm -hmm. keep him out of the labor force. Mm -hmm. So we have to balance that. Once mm -hmm. that happens, and people will say, oh, you know, it's been a, a good return on my investment to pull them out of, with the workforce and keep them in school. Mm -hmm. It's a complex issue. Mm -hmm. But it needs to be addressed not just on a family planning level or, or awareness, as many people say. It has to do with education, has to do with technology, uh, methods of production, it has to do with ownership of assets, uh, with a whole move towards um, a, another level of economy. Mm -hmm. But then, what has happened in Europe now is that they have an aging population. They stopped having babies, and now they have a big problem mm -hmm. because there's nobody yeah. to pay for the social security mm -hmm. of the aging population. So, mm -hmm. zero population growth is coming under big scrutiny right mm -hmm. now. That's true. Um, if we do have some statistics or approximate, uh, approximate numbers, how many Egyptians are living in informal settlements? Oh, at least half, 50%. 50% of whom? Of the Egyptians? Yes. You mean nearly 40 million? Yes. Then how many voters? Oh, how many of those are going to vote in the parliament? <sighs> oh, quite a few. Quite a few. I don't have an exact number, but yes. I mean, if, uh, if I'm going to say so, then the, parliament, uh, the, the candidates are going to focus on some areas at least for a short period of time to guarantee that we are going to vote for them and we are going to be representing in the coming parliament. Absolutely. Are they going to be used this way? And if this was one of the reasons the alien should be issued to be accurate and to be clear enough, and if this is going to be repeated, unfortunately, and this mm -hmm. is one of the reasons behind the infiltration of the rejected people who have been seeing and suffering for such, um, I would say, a black year in the modern history of Egypt? Well, uh, you hit a very important point on the nose, but um, um, yes, they are voters, and yes, they have needs, and yes, they will go to the polls and vote for those who provide them with a better life. Uh, those who will vote because of the urgency of their needs, the sugar and oil, uh, yeah, they, they're still out there because we haven't had enough time to address that issue of improving their lives to the point where they can make informed, intelligent, intelligent choices about the candidates they will vote for. We haven't had time to do that. That takes, that's nation building. Mm -hmm. But that has to happen and that's why in our program and our strategy for building up and upgrading informal settlements, uh, that is a major issue. Mm -hmm. To improve the lives of women who don't have good preschools for their kids, uh, to improve schools and slums, to do better uh, neighborhood replanning, to provide transport, uh, not to give out stuff. Giving out handouts right now is what's happening because of the elections maybe or whatever, but, but that's not the way to go about it. No, I kept asking myself, when a part, uh, when an MP or a member of the parliament is going to stop having cards, business cards, to give to the voters or to anyone, just um, uh, giving him a promise that it is going to be accepted or joining a school or his, um, his other um, um, son or daughter is going to be employed. 
the main task of a parliamentary member, I don't think it's going to be just giving a business card. Politically, uh, political awareness. Uh, I mean, I mean, this is uh, this is a little, a little bit far from our main topic. But how many years should we take to reach this political awareness among all Egyptians, and of course among those 40 millions we were talking about as living in informal settlements? Yeah, that depends on how serious we are about doing it. Mm -hmm. We have to do it right. We have to focus on <coughs> truly improving the livelihoods of these people, not uh, doing band-aid stuff and not keeping them happy f during election time, and working seriously to allocate resources and giving them priority in our land use policy, housing policy, transport policy, education policy, everything. They have to get priority. Mm -hmm. If we do that right, mm -hmm. then maybe in 10 years we, we will get there. But it is, it is about nation building. It's mm -hmm. not something that you do in one electoral round, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In order to give a better understanding of the driving force behind uh, the Ministry of Informal Settlements and Urban Development, uh, of course, uh, one might think that uh, you people are working on uh, the relocation of uh, the, the people in that uh, 20 towns, if you could allow me to say, or in informal settlements, and relocating them uh, into a better area. But there is also the culture that is uh, accompanying and that is born uh, with uh, those places. They could take it wherever they go. So th this becomes a problem also. Until you come to a complete makeover uh, of uh, this, the scene uh, in the, uh, the informal settlements areas in, uh, in Egypt, how can we be able, as Egyptians uh, in the society, because there are problems and crimes, and so we have numbered the problems that are related with uh, the impediments. So, um, how can we be able to be able to maybe uh, combat uh, this phenomenon, mm -hmm. uh, culture? You know, we have related to the we have a very um, uh, linear notion of how things happen in informal settlements and I'm hoping that you as media will help us mm -hmm. uh, correct that a little. It, it doesn't happen by finishing a task. It, it's mm -hmm. not about starting and ending something. Exactly that mm -hmm. It's complex. Okay, but it's doable. And when people move from wherever they are to another place, they're usually the risk takers, the adventurers, the ones who have another view of life want change. Mm. And uh, people don't move out as criminals together, mm. you know. People move out because of economic opportunity. So much so that they're willing to risk their lives on the Mediterranean and cross over to Europe. Mm. So these are not criminals. These are people looking for work. So the way to do it is to establish economic models and zones where you can provide people with work opportunities so they won't have to go to Libya and die or on the Mediterranean and die. Mm -hmm. If we were to provide people here with economic opportunity, they would stay and work. Mm -hmm. If you worked on that, you would get the bulk of informal sector people. Mm -hmm. Informal settlements, whether they are businesses or houses, are most, for the most part, law-abiding people. Mm -hmm. But the urban fabric in which mm -hmm. they find themselves attract others who are outside of the law. Mm -hmm. So it's only a minority mm -hmm. that engage in criminal activities mm -hmm. in these. But consequently, they make life very unpleasant and difficult for everybody around them, make it very hard for families to raise kids. So if you were to provide the economic opportunity elsewhere, I doubt that criminals would need move out to them. If you were to improve a particular neighborhood in situ and provide open spaces, roads, police presence, culture, activities, and so on, it would become antithetical to crime mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that it would improve. And that's been done all over the world, by the way. Mm -hmm. it, it is doable. And that's what we need to start doing. Both tracks. Mm -hmm. Improve the conditions of informal settlements right now so that they would uh, be... Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. they would be places where crime could not exist, mm -hmm. not easily at least. And 
uh, provide other opportunities outside of these informal settlements for new economic opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we have to go back to the roots of it, Upper Egypt. Mm -hmm. It's still vastly neglected, and until we do that, people will continue to... Mm -hmm. This is one of our national projects. And my final question was about those national projects. I mean, developing the Upper, e uh, upper Egypt uh, government rates in general, uh, building new uh, cities like the one of Rafah, of Al Alamein, of mm -hmm. uh, El Ismailiya, which was inspected by President El Sisi just yesterday. Have you had a plan in this? I mean, with every new city to be built, uh, do you think that this is going at least to dwindle, to dwindle or to decrease the number of slums or informal settlements? It will certainly provide economic opportunity and attract people from the densely populated areas to these new areas, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, we need to do more of that and all over Egypt, not just in the canal zone. We really need to look at Upper Egypt. There's a lot of opportunity, a lot of uh, young people looking for jobs there mm -hmm. and they're the ones who migrate to the urban centers and they're the ones who migrate to Europe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We all understand, or I mean, it's clear that uh, you people, you don't have a magic wand that you can touch uh, mm -hmm. something and you can turn it in a flash of a second. It takes time it to effect uh, success or to effect uh, achievement on the ground. But at the same time, there are places right now, new generations raising kids where there is no sanitation, there is no proper health care. Uh, there is no um, uh, other you know, facilities that are supposed to could be uh, fall under the umbrella of human rights. So uh, how do you handle problems like that, given the fact that um, you have very uh, little uh, uh, I mean limited sources, I mean financial sources and support and uh, human resources and all that. So how do you handle problems like existing problems that are going to take time in the future, but might need another different way of handling. Sure. Yeah, that's a very valid question. And of course, we have to start immediately with water and sanitation and mm -hmm. informal settlements along with land titling and secure land tenure mm -hmm. so that the people who live there really could give you the resources. Because as you said, rightly so, resources are limited. Mm -hmm. But look at how much money people have spent in building their current homes. Mm -hmm. They have equal amounts of money to fix the water and sanitation. But mm -hmm. you have to make it possible and do it in a participatory manner with them. Put water and sanitation and urban uh, informal settlements on the top priority of the Ministry of Housing. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's work in progress. Mm -hmm. yeah. Since I've mentioned drama and I mentioned artists, I cannot miss mentioning the initiative of Muhammad Subhi, the veteran artist. Um, in brief, how do you see it? It's an interesting experiment. We're all watching it. We're waiting to see how it will roll out and the impact of it. All uh, urban experiments uh, in time, uh, we're very proud that we have someone who's taking the initiative to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's one way, you know, it's building a nice community with all of its services and vocational school and um, health center and cultural center and so on. Mm -hmm. um, it's an experiment in urban uh, upgrading. We will watch it closely. But in parallel, we will also work on existing informal settlements mm -hmm. where people have jobs and small businesses uh, that need to be upgraded we can't wait until we this is urgent yeah right it's yeah. extremely urgent mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at the same time economic development underprivileged zones mm -hmm. like upper egypt mm -hmm. your excellency dr Laila spender minister of urban renewal and informal settlements we've enjoyed our time and we have the privilege to have you in this episode of the breakfast show have a very good day and we are going to leave you but with a promise to see you again on now to the international thank you, thank you. Thank you. pleasure Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you. Have a very good day, and I guess this is where we end this edition of the Breakfast Show. Uh, many thanks to you, Marina Abdurrahman, and to Nassim. We hope to see you again tomorrow. It's goodbye. Bye bye.